Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Svetlana Borodina, a postdoctoral fellow at the Harriman Institute and the organizer of the Work of Care in Russia lecture series. Today is our third event. Uh, we have been exploring various aspects that condition successes and failures of the Russian care system since uh, October this year. The recordings of our previous talks uh, by Dr. Maria Cristina Galmarini and by uh, Dr. Tatiana Chudakova are available on the Herman Institute's YouTube channel. Before we begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge the strike of graduate student workers here at Columbia University who have been fighting for fair compensation, access to necessary health care, and other just labor conditions. Today, they're holding a bolstered picket, and uh, we didn't have a chance to reschedule this event. However, it also will be available as a recording on the Herman Institute's um, YouTube channel. So please feel free to join them uh, in person if you feel, feel like doing so. A few housekeeping and logistical details. We are running this event as a webinar and uh, the audience can tune in on Zoom and uh, on YouTube where we are currently streaming live. Please uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions that come to you at any point. Uh, you can do so by typing your questions into the uh, Q&A feature if you're watching us on Zoom, or uh, you can post your questions uh, into the chat if you are connecting to us via YouTube. Uh, as usual, uh, I will ask those questions uh, after our speaker finishes her presentation during the Q&A session. Special thanks to the Harriman Institute for the support of the series and to Carly Jackson for her uh, organizational assistance. Finally, I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anna Klepikova. Dr. Klepikova is Dean and Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the European University at St. Petersburg, Russia. Her research interests include disability studies, anthropology of disability, medical anthropology, psychological anthropology, anthropological aspects of alternative and extended communication, healing, and magical services in modern Russia. Her work appeared in both Russian and English in such journals as the Journal of Social Policy Studies, Public Health Panorama, Ethnologia Polona, Social Services for, Sur for Children and Families, to name just a few. In 2018, her groundbreaking ethno ethnographic novel titled I Must Be a Fool, Naverna Yadurak, came out from the European University Press. In her presentation today, Dr. Klepikova discusses uh, the different approaches to disability care that she observed during her fieldwork at residential care facilities for disabled people in Russia. Without further ado, I turn it over to Anna. Um, hello. Um, everyone, so thank you, Svetlana, for <laughs> um, such a nice introduction. Uh, so um, I, th I think that uh, yeah, you could share the presentation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, today I will try uh, in, in, in this paper, I will try to merge my own story as an anthropologist doing field work and ethnography of the institutional care for people with uh, um, mental and multiple disabilities in Russia and uh, with some institutional ethn ethnography. Uh, I, uh, well, it's, uh, today my presentation will be well, completely without any theoretical um, discussions, uh, because I thought that it would be interesting to, well, um, um, present you this story of, uh, of uh, an ethnographer um, working in very <laughs> cultural specific <laughs> setting, institutional settings. Uh, so, um, in December uh, 2008, I was a first year MA student at the Department of Anthropology uh, at the European University in St. Petersburg. And I had soon to choose the topic of my MA project. I was constantly thinking about possible subjects that might interest me, but nothing came up uh, in my mind until uh, one day returning from classes, I took a bit well, different way and walked along the building surrounded by uh, 
concrete fence, a boarding school for blind and visually impaired children. In fact, it was situated not far from the place where I lived since my childhood. And that uh, building, that place always uh, fascinated me. I remembered that uh, from time to time, I used to see um, their groups of children wearing thick glasses and holding white sticks in their hands. I looked at the building uh, and uh, its windows were brightly lit and the windows had no curtains, so I could see the silhouettes of the dwellers. The territory was closed, um, and, and but I recall that when I was a child, there were some uh, well, holes in the grill of the fence of, of, of the gate and I could walk through. Um, and there was a small park uh, inside and a monument depicting a beautiful young girl reading, reading a braille book. Uh, and it looked very romantic. Please, um, next slide. So you could see this, uh, the, the fence uh, that surrounds the building and this, this very monument. Uh, I uh, that impressed me in my childhood, <clears throat> uh, and uh, at that time I was well, 20, 22, I guess, and I uh, had very romantic uh, thoughts. I felt I wanted to know and to study what it meant to be blind and what uh, the blind children's world uh, uh, was and. Uh, I wanted to study why the um, windows of the, that building had no curtains. Was it because some um, uh, magical institutional logic um, or implied that if the children couldn't see the world, they didn't care if anybody from that world uh, could see them in their private rooms or, or why else? I said I shared my thoughts with my research advisor. Uh, Ilya Utechin, and he said that uh, if I was interested in things like that, I'd better look at the institutions for children with mental retardation, as he formulated it. Uh, in fact, his idea was, uh, or the, behind that, was that he had access to that field. A year before, uh, he quite by chance got acquainted with volunteers who worked in the orphanage for children with intellectual disabilities. And he was allowed into the institution with a camera to film an ad about volunteers for the, um, um, who, who worked there. And, and this ad was meant for the NGO. I was frightened at that moment. The words mental reservation sounded absolutely astonishing. And I was paralyzed with fear. When I was studying in uh, primary school, our class teacher used to discipline the class by calling us mentally retarded. Um, she could say just the first uh, letters M, R, or U, O in Russian, uh, the first letters of the diagnosis. And it was uh, this label, these two letters, uh, they were a swear and a curse and well, a derogative uh, label. Um, and uh, so mental retardation was the worst that could happen to you. And uh, the very contact with it uh, was, well, using Mary Douglas term, polluting. With, uh, so with all that in mind, I searched through the social network web and uh, found the ad Ilya made for the NGO. So the next slide, please. Um, it's just a, a screenshot of that uh, video. Um, I was impressed with what I saw. Um, th though the video was focused on volunteers and apparently the cameraman uh, tried not to film children themselves, I focused on those children I could see there. I saw children with severe disabilities, distorted bodies, swelling heads, visible signs of genetic pathologies and so on. Some looked dirty from food or saliva, others made strange gestures, rolled their bodies or waved their hands. Uh, I felt fear and pity and disgust, but simultaneously I saw volunteers, young men and women in their early 20s, exactly my peers, who were carrying those children in their arms, hugging them and kissing them, playing with them, tickling them, feeding them, brushing their teeth, uh, and so on. And they showed no apparent disgust or any other feelings that I have experienced. Uh, it should be said that at that time, it's 
13 years ago, uh, people with disabilities seldom drew attention of media, while uh, most of um, them were hidden from the public eye in the state-run uh, as asylums or at their own homes. Uh, I knew uh, there was a young man with Down syndrome living in the neighborhood, and he uh, even uh, worked at some shelter uh, uh, workshop. Uh, but I hardly could imagine that uh, such children with uh, severe multiple disabilities exist. I was shocked, both, both with the children's physical condition uh, and uh, at the same time by the environment of the um, institution that reminded me of an early post-Soviet hospital and uh, or simultaneously of a post-Soviet kindergarten. Volunteers whose eyes were burning with inspiration surprised me even more. Why did they decide to go and work with such strange children? Why did they look happy doing that? Why did they show positive emotions and uh, no fear? So um, finally, um, the, uh, well, Ilya's, uh, the, the idea of my, of my research advisor worked and uh, it was like a hook for me. And I decided to learn more about the motivations of the volunteers and their experience. Uh, so um, I joined them both as a volunteer and as a participant observer for my dissertation research. Here, I think I should provide you with some context. Um, a system of boarding schools for children with different types of disabilities, the system of large residential institutions where children stay permanently, and the system of long-term care institutions for adults with disabilities are the legacy of the, the Soviet uh, social policy uh, that is still, um, the legacy is still uh, present in, in today's Russia. Uh, the next slide, please. In Russia, well, a considerable number of people with mental disabilities permanently live in the state-run residential uh, care institutions, uh, usually referred to as psychoneurological uh, institutions. Um, most of such institutions for people with disabilities date back to 1960s. Uh, that means uh, that uh, these large institutions for people with disabilities started to, started to emerge in the Soviet Union right when uh, the deinstitutionalization de processes in Europe and the US were about to begin. Um, you have some statistics on the slide, but it's not, in fact, very exact, uh, but um, we don't have and reliable statistics here. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, so in some, for example, in St. Petersburg, it's the place where the city where I live, the second largest city in Russia, uh, with this population of about 5 million people. Um, there are eight residential institutions for adults with mental health problems uh, and multiple disabilities housing from uh, well, uh, 20, 100 to 1,000 people. Uh, the one where I worked was that one that housed uh, 1,000 people. Um, so 6,000 uh, people in total. And uh, so five residential care homes for children with mental retardation, as they were uh, called, and as they're called. Um, Currently, housing from 50 to uh, 350 children, um, 800 children in total. But at the time when I uh, conducted research, these numbers were higher. Um, so, but I have no no statistics about uh, well uh, exact figures uh, about the situation well 12 years ago, but in the institution where I worked, uh, there were 500 uh, children. Uh, so the majority of uh, children with intellectual disabilities uh, live at home with their parents in Russia, especially in case of mild mental retardation or autism, um, this discovered well, usually later in life, not when a child is born. Um, but uh, children whose parents decided to institutionalize them, stay in hospitals or psychoneurological uh, baby houses uh, till the age of four. And they, then they moved to a specialized children's home or 
Uh, they may also come uh, to the children's home directly from families if parents decide to institutionalize a child later in, in, in her life. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, according to their official profile, the specialized children's uh, institutions accommodate children with confirmed intellectual disability uh, that might be accompanied by well, other diagnoses. Uh, you can just see them on the slide. Um, and um, the majority of uh, children in the institutions uh, uh, show some degree of intellectual disabilities from mild to profound, but uh, some of them have been diagnosed with mental retardation. Uh, uh, well, it's official, official diagnosis basing on the physical and speech impairments that are in fact due, for example, to cerebral palsy. Uh, that is a neurological condition that does not necessarily affect intellectual abilities. Um, the ne next slide. Uh, Psychoneurological residential institutions for adults house, house more diverse populations, uh, population. Uh, two largest group of residents are um, constituted by people with mental disabilities, including people with different types of dementia and congenital intellectual disabilities. And um, some residents have um, uh, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, and some have purely neurological diagnoses like cerebral palsy or epilepsy. So, according to its profile, uh, a psychoneurological residential institution accommodates people with both psychiatric and neurological diagnoses, which is an approach inherited from the Soviet medical and welfare system. It means that people with quite different intellectual abilities and mental health state live together behind the walls of the same building. They are grouped together in these institutions basing not on their mental health state, but rather on their failure to take full care of themselves and live a completely independent life. Mm, some institutions, including uh, the one where I worked, also uh, comprise a prison for mm, so-called criminally insane. Uh, so during uh, the winter holidays of uh, 2009, I was uh, googling phrases. Uh, so I'm returning to my to my own story. Uh, I was googling phrases like psychoneurological institutions, uh, mental retardation, and so on. And I tried to accommodate myself with the appalling images I saw. Uh, so at that time, any positive representations of disability in the media were uncommon in Russia. And uh, at some point, uh, suddenly I noticed that my fear wasn't so pronounced anymore. And I stopped, uh, well, I ceased, and I ceased to feel sick uh, from uh, disgust when I stared at these images. I started to be curious. I felt I wanted to know more about what mental retardation was, what it meant to be intellectually disabled, how such people think, what do they know? Uh, what is important to them? What makes up the world a meaningful environment, uh, especially in these restrict, restricted and well, meager conditions of the institution? Uh, the next slide, please. Then I started to read um, Lev Vygotsky, a uh, Soviet psychologist who formulated the principles of cultural, historical uh, psychology and so-called defectology. And I was captured by his idea that mental or physical defects, as he called them, uh, do not completely determine the root of a child's psychological development. Rather, it's the interaction of a child with the social environment that finally determines the consequences uh, of the organic defects. Thus, uh, I learned that a blind child is not from the point of view of the child itself, uh, separated, he, he, it is not separated from the world by a dark uh, wall. The social model of disability uh, implies that the limitations imposed on people with disabilities to a large extent spring from the social environment, but not from their physical and mental conditions. And um, to a certain extent, this approach takes root in Vygotsky's uh, ideas. I was inspired by his concepts uh, and by the attention he paid to the development of the personality of the defective as he called it, child. And uh, the ideas of uh, humanistic, uh, I was inspired by the ideas of humanistic uh, pedagogy at large. 
I thought that uh, investing into the development of and care for the children with impairment is an important way of being human. So a series of negotiations with uh, the NGO followed and they were eager to recruit me uh, as a new uh, volunteer as they were um, short of hands. Uh, and they supported the idea of my uh, research project as long as everything published remains anonymous and um, it couldn't be as uh, well uh, interpreted by the administration of the institutions as a uh, as a threat or accusation. Um, so uh, with um, the next slide, please. Uh, so with a mixture of derogative and romantic stereotypes that I had to disprove and uh, the desire to overcome my fear and become like other volunteers and with a mixture of curiosity to learn about, to, to learn more about the world of uh, disabled children in the early March of 2009, I took a suburban train and traveled 40 minutes to the outskirts of St. Petersburg where the institution for the children. Uh, was situated. So I traveled there to start my way as a volunteer and participant observer. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, the department where the NGO worked, uh, in fact, it was a separate building. Uh, it housed about 150 children aged from 4 to 18. Uh, this was the department for most severely disabled. Only a few children out of uh, 150 could walk or talk. Um, they were separated into 11 rooms or groups as it uh, well th they were called uh, and each room uh, housed 13 children. Uh, I will uh, this uh, well, unit I will uh, I will uh, call a group um, it's just <laughs> very accustomed to this term. Uh, so, um, uh, there were groups for more active children and groups for weaker children, but the classification principle wasn't universal. In fact, children with various diagnoses and quite different abilities could live in the same room. Uh, for example, a physically well, able child uh, uh, with moderate intellectual disability, a paralyzed child with um, average intellectual abilities and a child with severe multiple disabilities, for example. Uh, the rooms were um, rather small for uh, such a population. Um, the next slide, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, they were stuffed with children's beds standing side by side, and uh, well, the conditions were rather crowded. There was no place for personal. Um, um, well, bedside tables, and there was hardly space for wheelchairs or other special orthopedic devices in those rooms or groups. Uh, clothes were kept in uh, large wardrobes, and they were, were, were not uh, private. Mm. Next slide. Uh -huh. Uh, usually, uh, one or two NGO volunteers were assigned to one group of children, and uh, volunteers didn't only play with children or take them for a walk, but they fed them, cleaned their teeth, changed diapers, washed, dressed, undressed, and so on. They were involved in the daily care routines, um, but the major task was to develop a child's communication skills. So I had to do everything uh, other volunteers did. I was assigned to a group of quite active boys. You can see the, well, the room where I worked um, on the slide. Um, other groups were mixed uh, in gender uh, because there was no fear of, of um, sexual relationship between uh, the children, um, either because they were paralyzed or thought to have extremely low intellectual abilities. But my boys were rather active physically and intellectually, so they were separated from others. Uh, some of them could talk and some could crawl and move around. Um, three or four of them were already adolescents and one of them was 18. They greeted me eagerly and uh, crawling um, around me asked if I was going to come again. 
uh, there, um, well, the, this group uh, had no volunteer, another volunteer. One of the boys, um, I noticed that one of the boys had running nose, another a large sore on his hip. <clears throat> a third had um, a dental abscess and so on. I realized that they were very sick apart from their disabilities and no apparent intention was pay paid to the infections uh, they had. I felt some fear, but not because the children were disabled. With Wagoski in mind, I was thinking beyond the impairments. I saw the children who were craving for attention, uh, entertainment, and hugs. And I saw a young man who was interested in girls and adult relationship and in some adult communication. Still, I was scared that the infectious diseases were contagious and I felt frustrated as I would have to change diapers. Uh, while the boys, in fact, were not uh, children, uh, some of them were quite grown up, uh, and uh, a few of them suffered from incontinence. Uh, however, the volunteer coordinator just said uh, something like, it's okay uh, for you, when I told her that uh, the boy had running nose. And I felt that the, the question on, of... Um, how do I fight with disgust or some difficult feelings uh, and fears while providing hygiene and contacting with infection? Uh, these questions were out of place. I just told myself that I must be strong and overcome myself. Um, the next slide. Um, the coordinator told me to take one of the children who was nearly blind and had severe cerebral palsy to the playroom. She helped me to position him uh, in the wheelchair uh, he was rather happy as he was already eight years old. Uh, and um, well, this boy, and his name is Lyosha, he was played, uh, placed to the institution just half, year, uh, half a year before. Uh, as he grew uh, uh, heavier, his mother couldn't manage well uh, to care for him anymore. And it's a quite typical situation that parents decide to institutionalize uh, children when they reach school age. Uh, Lyosha was obviously depressed and apathetic, and the, my task was to find some means of communication to make him feel better psychologically. Um, so, um, in the playroom, I tried to find contact with, with Lyosha. I used musical toys and waited for reactions from him. It was an experiment. I, in fact, I didn't know what to do. I didn't work with children before and, in fact, had never played with them uh, as, as an adult. Um, the, um, but suddenly, uh, Lyosha reacted. He smiled and laughed at some sounds. The coordinator peeped in and watched us for some minutes. I see you are fine, she said, and left. Uh, I felt that I passed well, a kind of test. I was nervous, but I liked to communicate with Lyosha. Uh, and he would become a child I would feel most attached to in uh, next months. Uh, so on my very first day at the orphanage, it became clear for me that apart from the enthusiastic volunteers, I would have to work uh, closely uh, with the st staff of the publicly run institution. Um, the personnel of the institution who cared for the children uh, uh, well, on a daily basis included attendant nurses, medical nurses, and uh, a few instructors. Usually during the day, um, a group of about 12 14 children was serviced by one attendant nurse and uh, an instructor in some, uh, well, in uh, three groups of more active children, including mine. Uh, and both of them were busy providing basic care, like feeding, changing clothes, or diapers. Uh, next slide. Um, as I soon learned uh, when I started to come regularly, uh, the institutional routines followed a more or less rigid timetable, organized around breakfast, lunch, and dinner, around and around the upper changing process three times a day, and around, well, a, well, a weekly schedule was organized around a bath once a week. <laughs> Imagine that one attendant nurse had to take care of 13 children who were either paralyzed or couldn't care for themselves. It meant that in the first place, uh, a nurse who worked 24 hours turn soon became exhausted. And secondly, that she had only limited time to spend to care for each child and could give, them, uh, the, could give the children only limited attention. 
say the breakfast was served uh, at nine and it had to be finished by 10. And at 10, for example, the diaper changing uh, or bath was scheduled. Uh, while at 11 followed a small brunch like juice or fruit and so on. In between, the nurse had to wash dishes, wash the floor, change the soil, linen or clothes, mend, mend the clothes, and do a variety of small tasks. As such institutional organization made instructors rather help nurses basing on solidarity um, than um, educate children. Another reason here was that instructors were not sure that education would make them, the children, any profit. The children were often referred to as hopeless or uneducable. I was met with a, a hostile inattention by the nurse and the instructor. When I'm um, saying nurse, I mean the attendant nurses, but not the medical nurses. Um, uh, so, um, the, the, the instructor and the nurse pretended either I didn't exist or I was a nuisance. And uh, it was a more difficult situation for me uh, as for a person and a field worker than those, the children's sore eyes or smells uh, that uh, uh, were in the air. Uh, I soon learned that there was a major conflict developing between the NGO volunteers and the staff of the institution. It was obvious that the um, volunteers and the personnel uh, characterized by, uh, were characterized by different discourses on disability and uh, that they exercise uh, two different sets of practices um, in their everyday routines. And those two conflict models of understanding disabilities uh, caused continuous misunderstandings, quarrels, and conflicts between the volunteers and the staff. Um, so I just have all sides some random examples. Uh, thus, the nurses fed the children in rather hostile and quite rude manner. Remember the institution, uh, institutional organization of their routines. Uh, one of the results of such has the feeding, by the way, is that the children don't learn to chew. Uh, only, uh, um, but uh, volunteers try to feed the children carefully, ch ch teaching them how to hold the spoon uh, and how to, well, how, how to eat themselves. Um, and they allowed the child to be independent during the process. Um, the nurses on that time were irritated by the fact that volunteers didn't share the load equally. While a nurse fed 10 children, a volunteer could manage to feed, uh, feed just three. Uh, nurses perceived volunteers as a force sent to help them, nurses, while the NGO objected to such understanding. Volunteers, uh, from the NGO's point of view, were primarily there, uh, there primarily to support the children. Uh, the personnel tried to give uh, less food and drink to well, some of uh, the children, to the weaker children who didn't use the toilet themselves and who wore diapers. That was both to save the diapers um, and the personnel's efforts to change them. Uh, and um, uh, if a child, for example, defecated in discordance with the timetable, uh, the child was scorned and blamed for it by the staff. Uh, so the child body in this regime reminded of a mechanism converted food into waste products and some children in, uh, internalized such, point, uh, such view and when they grow up they try to eat less or drink less in order not to turn to others uh, for help too often. Um, food and especially water uh, well, uh, deprivation was opposed to by volunteers. I tried myself to give more juice to such the children secretly. And when discovered, I was once attacked by the nurse snatching the juice out of my hands and pouring it into the sink, saying that, um, uh, and she, she said, that, although in apologizing tone that the institution provided three diapers per child uh, a day, and if uh, he drank uh, well, uh, too much, <laughs> in fact, just a few sips, uh, he would stay wet for hours. Um, the next slide. Uh, the institution itself uh, provides place for very basic hygiene procedures necessary to sustain life, as I've said, already said. 
uh, personnel, with a few exceptions, think of the residents, both uh, well, uh, of uh, think of children as dirty and contagious, uh, and this dirt is due to their illness or disability. And as they're dirty by nature, um, this is well a symbolic dirt that can be uh, removed. So they uh, uh, there's no need to wash or uh, wash them thoroughly provide uh, thorough hygiene. Uh, volunteers objected to it too. According to their views, ch children were naturally clean and uh, it would be offending to talk about their bodily fluids, so they silenced their own difficulties when dealing with uh, defecation, sweat, or saliva. They introduced new hygiene procedures like toothbrushing, um, and uh, here, uh, and uh, um, there it was viewed uh, not just uh, um, uh, as hygiene procedure, but as a frame for play and for developing self-care skills. And the same with bathroom. Volunteers introduced special foams and shampoos for children and um, tried to wash them um, carefully, uh, turning the baths also into, uh, into play. And it uh, irritated the nurses tremendously. They explained that children didn't understand whether what they were washed, uh, just well, basic soap or, or uh, special shampoo with a nice smell. And they took home those shampoos uh, that volunteers brought um, because the, well, their grandchildren needed them more. At the same time, nurses could bring uh, well, used clothes or diapers from their homes to provide better care for the children in accordance with their views of what care was, uh, or, or what care those children needed. Uh, one of the nurses, for example, brought medication against COP or against digestion problems. Um, the medication that medical nurses or physicians uh, often refused to prescribe uh, to children saying that they were sick by nature. But that nurse, she wanted the children to feel uh, better. Uh, children had no private space to keep their personal uh, belongings, um, and they uh, didn't have many of, of those belongings. Volunteers uh, brought tried well to bring toys or some well, other well, CDs for all the children or some devices. Uh, so. Um, they could play or do something uh, apart from lying in bed. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, well, they, they brought them those small presents uh, and uh, they uh, tried to persuade personnel to leave uh, well, some toys in a child's bed. Uh, but um, it was also a regular reason for uh, conflict. Uh, volunteers brought toys or uh, uh, presents, and the next day those toys were in the garbage bin. The same happened uh, when in the morning volunteers came and took children out of bed and put them into wheelchairs um, for them not to lie in bed the whole day. And usually when volunteer returned from the playroom with one of the children, uh, she or he uh, well, saw that um, the children were put back to bed by the nurses. Uh, these were uh, symbolic gestures addressed to the volunteer community uh, in the first place. Uh, but in the second place, the nurses explained that the wheelchairs occupied too much space in the room and uh, that the child uh, being sick and disabled was too tired to sit in the wheelchair and that this child needed to be constantly in bed. Uh, they explained that the toys were a nuisance. They made children more active and uh, prevented them from sleeping during the daytime nap. Uh, which meant that um, nurses couldn't leave the group and take a rest on the sofa in, in the hall. Um, uh, um, I'm just trying to skip something because I think I'm running out of time. Um, so, um, The problem was that volunteers' interventions, well, the toys they brought and the games they played with children uh, the, and the methods of alternative communication they used, uh, the attention they gave um, to the children, 
um, it made uh, almost all the children more active partners in communication. The children started to demand more attention from nurses. Uh, they began to cry and uh, more and to be picky. It was a major discomfort for the nurses. They couldn't and, uh, and um, react to all of these uh, newly formed com communicative intents. Uh, in fact, they didn't have to according to their formal um, uh, tasks, but um, this task of controlling and caring for 13 children at once uh, became uh, unfeasible due to the uh, volunteers, the effect of the volunteers' efforts. For example, when uh, Lyosha started uh, to form an att attachment to me and to cry a lot, demanding my exclusive attention, the personnel tried to, to limit my contact with him and sometimes prohibited me to approach him, trying in their view to well, normalize and set back the situation. But the problem was that Lyosha wasn't as retarded as they thought. Uh, he could hear my voice and he knew I was somewhere near and cried even more. Mm. Uh, I guess the next slide, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, I was shocked by the way the nurses treated the children. Uh, I eagerly listened to other volunteers' terrible stories about what the nurse and the group said or did, and supported the frame, um, this frame by telling my own terrible stories. And for me, both uh, for a person and a researcher, uh, uh, it was at uh, the beginning, it was clear that the volunteers were always right. They knew what was better for the child because they were basing on the principles of the humanistic pedagogics and on, on the principles of the Western ideology of normalization for people with disabilities. Uh, but in fact, um, during the day, I spent more time with the nurses and instructors, um, the, public, the, the staff of the public institution. As an anthropologist, I tried to find uh, contact with all of them. Uh, that was difficult in the beginning, but I tried to show uh, understanding. I used the tactics of small steps. I asked to give uh, a child um, a, a permission to give a child just one more sip of juice. I offered my help around the group. I washed dishes. Uh, well, and so on. Though this contradicted uh, the volunteers' ideology. Once uh, I saw the instructor and elderly woman to the bus station as she needed help that day. Um, I started to take part in small talk about their personal life um, and nurses began to show me the pictures of their children and grandchildren and to boast of their successes. I told them that I was writing an email paper about the patterns of social work and care work and they welcomed it. Uh, for them, it wasn't a problem, as I expected. Uh, it was a certain alleviation. They now knew I had an understandable practical reason for working as a volunteer. Um, uh, while sheer volunteers with the strange ideas were uh, suspicious. Um, now we know that you are normal, they used to say. And um, day by day, they gave me more and more freedom and they started to recognize that children, including Yosha, made some success and developed some skills due to um, my work. I could understand in my turn that the problem wasn't that uh, the nurses were cruel women uh, or uh, something like that, but their models of care differed from the volunteers. They had another image and uh, another uh, concept of disability. They haven't read Vygotsky like me. They knew the child had to be safe and fed, and that was enough for him or her, as the, um, those children were mentally retarded and crippled, and thus they were not capable of normal social and cultural functioning. I could understand how physically hard was their, their job. When all the children in the group cried or shouted, it was unbearable for me uh, as well. My back was constantly aching from lifting heavy children. But as a volunteer, I had to hide it and get over. Uh, nurses didn't help. They wanted to stay healthy enough to do their household jobs, to carry bags from the supermarket and so on. Um, they were older than volunteers and belonged to another social class. Um, the nurses were humans embedded in the very difficult institutional settings um, with the ideals and goals quite different from, from volunteers. 
I also thought that I, if I haven't read Vygotsky, I would have been full of the same stereotypes about disabled children as nurses were. And I really was before. Remember the very uh, um, uh, the words uh, mental retardation that scared me. Um, at the same time, I started to distance myself from volunteers and to look at their ideology as if I wasn't, um, as if it was an intentionally uh, elaborated construct. I uh, couldn't I discuss the difficult emotions I felt during the care work? Why children's infections were silenced uh, as if I couldn't catch them? And they were not, not just common colds. Some children had uh, B and C um, hepatitis, and during um, uh, well, the work, uh, volunteers const constantly contacted children's saliva and blood, at least while cleaning their teeth. Why did I have to overcome and silence uh, my back ache? Uh, why couldn't I help the nurse seeing, uh, well, an elderly woman uh, seeing how tired she was? Uh, were children really crying always out of um, uh, psychological, uh, well, some discomfort um, and not out of hunger like uh, the um, personnel um, admitted? Uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, the volunteers' ideology offered just another quite romantic construct of persons with mental and multiple disabilities, and uh, they actually constructed a rigid code of a volunteer adhering to a which uh, made one work um, efficiently, more efficiently for the sake of the NGO and its ideal. Uh, so um, I had a feeling that in the situation of lack of resources, the NGO exploited volunteers to uh, achieve uh, well, its humanistic goals. Um, I will say just a few words uh, maybe about my, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, <laughs> um, what to do, but I'll, I, I will, because I, I'm out of time, but I will say just a few words about my uh, fieldwork in the institution for uh, adults. Uh, it was my second year of my fieldwork. I moved to it well, um, after finishing my fieldwork at the uh, child, uh, uh, at the orphanage for children. Um, so the next slide. Uh, this is how it looks like. It's really... Um, uh, large it houses 1,000 people, as uh, I said, and uh, naturally it resembled uh, um, well, it, it resembled the uh, um, psychiatric clinic that Irving Kaufman described in Total Institution. Uh, so um, maybe the next slide. So this uh, some details. Um, here, um, uh, the main conflict was developing not between volunteers and nurses, but between volunteers and uh, medical staff who were um, uh, responsible for various psychiatric, uh, psychiatric restrictions, uh, like forced administration of sedative drugs and involuntary hospitalizations. Um, and all that volunteers met with indignation. It was a uh, the conflict that can be briefly described in terms of a conflict between the social constructionist and medicalized approaches to um, mental illness. Um, so maybe the next slide, just to see some uh, yeah. uh, environment. Um, in fact, an undesirable and um, rule-breaking behavior, like hysterical behavior, self-aggression, and, um, and so on, was commonplace among the residents. Uh, and uh, uh, the medical staff uh, um, interpreted it as an uh, intrinsic attribute of mental illness and deficiency. Uh, residents exhibiting any type of undesirable behavior underwent so-called psychiatric treatments, well, including this involuntary sedative injection or appeal of being um, admitted to a psychiatric uh, hospital. Uh, but um, uh, let's just um, I will cite one example. 
um, you, you could uh, see, uh, as you could see on the slide, uh, during the daytime, uh, only one or two nurses serviced about 80, um, 80 residents. Um, and uh, naturally, in, um, they were incapable to feed and uh, uh, will change diapers well, for all of them. The practical way out was that most capable residents uh, were involved in the constant unpaid care work and were thus exploited by the institution and it had its uh, uh, consequences. Well, uh, just imagine someone involved in the unregulated 24-7 labor. Um, the residents were constantly caring for their neighbors um, while lifting them, feeding them, changing their diapers or clothes. And they got cigarettes or cookies or other symbolic privileges for their labor, well, a system described by Goffman and others. Um, sometimes, uh, well, they could be tired and had a breakdown that was interpreted by the medical staff as a psycho as psychotic behavior. At the same time, though, um, psychosis is something an individual can't control. Um, the staff framed the psychiatric treatment as punishment or moral training, thus admitting the well, deliberate nature of psychotic or hysterical behavior. Mm, while volunteers view, uh, viewed those undesirable behavior and breakdowns as resulting from um, the conditions that um, in the, uh, which the residents uh, lived. And volunteers tried to defend the residents from the excessive use of psychiatric power, but uh, here they were even more powerless than in the fight with the nurses in, in um, the children's home. Uh, here uh, in the institution for adults, uh, I started to distance myself from the volunteers community even more. Uh, I think you can switch the, ne the next slide uh, for a uh, well, some seconds and then the last one. Uh, um, um, rather, um, um, I didn't form any type of solidarity with nurses or medical staff in the adult institutions, uh, but uh, maybe rather with, with the residents themselves. I started to notice that the volunteer ideology worked differently in the in case of children and adults. Suddenly I noticed that volunteers wore medical gloves in this institution uh, when they worked with residents, when they fed them and so on, which th that was unthinkable in the children's home. They could uh, talk about the bad smells and uh, that the residents emitted and they could talk about their disgust to what the, it was the care work with adults. Um, volunteers themselves were far more restrictive towards adults and used quite harsh discursive means uh, of control. At the same time, uh, uh, volunteers couldn't get rid of the broad uh, uh, cultural stereotypes. Thus, here uh, in the adult institution, volunteers um, saw that if a disabled uh, uh, person could be in love romantically, uh, they shouldn't at the same time be allowed to practice sex and even to talk about sex. So strangely, um, in the case, uh, in case of adult people with multiple disabilities, the traditional paternalistic stereotypes remain stronger than um, and stay stronger than the Western ideology of normalization and social model disability that the NGO promoted. Perhaps. Um, uh, it has something to do with the fact that since that time, um, since the time I was doing my fieldwork in 2009-2010, the institutions for children underwent well major changes and their population dropped twice and school education for children was introduced. While the reform of the public system of care for disabled adults in Russia has, uh, hasn't been uh, has been introduced and implemented. And the building with a thousand dwellers well, that resembles a huge ugly vessel stays there as it was 10 years ago. Thank you. I think I will, I'm going to finish here. 
Thank you so much, Anna. This is this is uh, fantastic. And uh, as a person who have had the privilege of reading the book, I really uh, recommend this such detailed ethnography to anybody who can read in Russian. It's called Naverna Yadurak. And I cannot wait uh, for this book to be translated into English because I truly it, will. it is. It will. Yes, it, it's, uh, it has already been translated, but I think uh, it will take time for the editing work and publishing. So. It's just fantastic, and I think that it's uh, impossible to compress the richness of the material into, into this short presentation. So I wanted to remind um, our, our uh, audience to pose the questions either to the Q&A feature or to the chat if you're tuning in through Zoom. But I will take uh, the privilege of asking the first questions as we are waiting for the uh, questions for the, uh, from the audience. Um, and as a person who did read uh, the text, and I wanted to uh, ask you to elaborate more uh, on the personas of nurses and, uh, and the instructors. Uh, so if we are talking about the child's homes uh, and um, as well as the volunteers, who are these people? What, what kind of brings them to this, uh, to work there? And I, I really think that uh, I loved the portraits and the stories that you gave in the book because they, they situated the people so well and they kind of uh, showed what pressures and struggle they have, each of them, uh, before they step into this, uh, into this uh, home. Yeah, thanks for the question. I omitted it from my uh, presentation because uh, just to make it uh, shorter, <laughs> um, but it's really very, very important. Um, in fact, um, I uh, in the paper I call them like nurses, but uh, they are not uh, unanimous. They're not. Um, they, they, there are different types of nurses. I uh, in my group uh, five, uh, six and bad nurses worked, and there were two instructors, all of them women, uh, and um, uh, in. Uh, it seems that in uh, each each group there were uh, like two bad, I mean volunteers labor, labels, uh, two bad nurses, two neutral nurses, and one good nurse. Uh, and it was uh, well the situation in my in my group uh, um, too. So they in, in fact it's a collective portrait that I gave here, but. Uh, uh, one of them was, uh, all of them lived uh, not far from the um, institution and so in the small, um, oh, it's not a town, it's really an outskirt of, of St. Petersburg um, and they live somewhere around. Uh, and uh, most of them, but not all of them, but most of them were in the 50s or in the 60s, so um they were retired uh, from the previous jobs uh, and uh, they um before uh, before um uh, well uh, taking up this uh, job they could, they well they could have very well different um, uh, a whole variety of backgrounds uh like working on the railway or uh, the customs uh, or just uh, selling something uh, in the street market or just anything. Uh, usually they uh, um, didn't have higher education and uh, they, um, well, um, and usually these uh, jobs suited their, well, <laughs> The routines, uh, like uh, they were busy two days a week. They worked in turns, uh, like one uh, uh, day twenty four seven, and then say three or four uh, uh, days break. And it was uh, okay for them because they took care of their grandchildren and so on. Um, and there, uh, there's uh, also a um, public package of well, so social guarantees uh, for 
uh, this type of work as and they enjoyed them. Uh, though they were not, uh, uh, well, they were quite underpaid when, when I um, was, um, well, at that time when I was doing field work. Uh, so, um, uh, and um, among them was in my group, uh, there was a woman who, uh, who was, she was heavily drinking and she was extremely cruel and uh, uh, it's, it was uh, really, um, I couldn't make any contact with her because she wasn't interested in contact to, uh, in any contact with me and uh, she wasn't interested in doing anything for children. She was just interested to um, well, earn some money and leave. She was uh, she was fired some time after I left uh, the, the, the whole finished the field work there, luckily. Um, so, uh others uh, were like um, more um, more caring in fact and uh they showed uh affection to some of children um and, and the same with instructors they were um uh, so their well practices and ideology differed from uh, well, approaches um, of the volunteers, they uh, still had, uh, it, it, it uh, didn't mean that they uh, were, um, uh, that, that they didn't like, uh, wanted to care for, for the children or in, in their uh, understanding of care. So uh, volunteers were, uh, um, uh, well, they came from another social class, as I said, they usually were university students uh, and uh, some of them were, um, they, some of them had religious background, uh, but uh, the majority were, when didn't belong to any religious organizations. Um, and uh, also the majority of them, uh, they didn't, uh, uh, well, the university education was in economics and philology, just anything, but not in special education. Though there were several volunteers with such background. Uh, usually they came, uh, well, uh, to this organization and wanted to be recruited as volunteers when they found themselves in some, times, uh, in some type of existential crisis when they were not uh, satisfied with their job or with their education. Um, so um, they were, mm, I can't call them well, may maybe I can call them belonging to the lower middle class, like uh, <laughs> judging by Russian Russian standards, uh, and uh, um, they had well these romantic ideas uh, and some existential ideas of helping them themselves uh, and co correcting like their own psych uh, via via the work with uh, via working with disabled children. So um, I think that's uh, I'm talking too much already. No, no, it's it's all so interesting. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, one comment and one question from the audience. So one comment comes from Rachel Denver, who says that she doesn't have a question, but uh, I needed to leave, but wanted to say that this was an excellent nuanced presentation on an important issue, I can't wait to read your book. Um, uh, and then we have a question from Emily Bailey. Uh, it, it goes as follows. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your research. I'm a current anthropology student studying the intersection between autism and labor. I was wondering if there were work programs for the residents of the adult facility, whether in-house or out in the community. If yes, what were they like? And also, could you talk a little bit about the social reality of adults with disabilities that don't live in residential facilities? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, um, 
When I was uh, working uh, and doing field work, uh, there were no programs for um, people, well, for any any residents with autism or with other um, problems, uh, except for the uh, labor inside the institution. Uh, I was talking about the unpaid labor, but in fact, uh, several um, residents were um, recruited as paid paid um, staff, uh, and they were working as nurses or as uh, um, well some technical personnel uh, inside the institution. But um, well, I think I guess around two thousand and twelve. Uh, um, the um, job placing program started to to emerge. Um, if we're talking about the institution, they were um, well. Um, it was uh, like the institution builds a, a rehabilitation center, and uh, yeah, on the territory of the institution or closely connected to the territory uh, of the institution. And uh, uh, there uh, will create some and implement some kind of social rehabilitation program uh, in uh, the framework of which residents work uh, well inside this center, like, uh, or uh, they may, for example, I don't know, cook for themselves or something like that. So they they don't get a real a real job, though. Uh, officially, um, um, the administration of the institution account uh, to uh, um, the, um, so, so the the government, local governments, and that they have this uh, job placement program. So it's. Uh, uh, it's a major problem because uh, uh, when NGOs uh, try to lobby uh, those uh, programs, uh, job programs for the residents of the institution, they, uh, well, the government uh, well, <laughs> reacts that, oh, we have a lot of programs. Every institution has has their programs, everything's okay. But in fact, they're, well, they're not in the community and uh, they're not meant to be in the community by the institution because the institution wants to control them. Um, they, they, in fact, some, some well, uh, residents who are, well, who, for example, have some very slight pro pro problems. They just uh, um, were legally capable and everything. They just uh, le uh, well, uh, leave the institution and fi find some uh, job place themselves. So they, but they usually have good contact with the administration because they're viewed like they're normal people just living in the in this second neurological institution. So oh, they're allowed to to to, to um, um, find the jobs themselves. Mm, uh, and um, mm, as for um, the more broad context of um, uh, the life of uh, people with disabilities and with autism uh, outside the institution. I, uh, my, my next project, in fact, was dedicated to the families uh, with um, uh, children and, in fact, with adolescents and uh, adult people, uh, well, g g grown up people who, um, who, who lived in, in uh, not in the institution, but in the families. I focused more on uh, parents' views and uh, their stories uh, of rehabilitation. Um, so I have some material on that, uh, not only general, well, uh, uh, image and general knowledge. Um, I think this is quite uh, rapidly uh, developing um, segment in, in, in Russia because uh, there are a lot of uh, um, NGOs and parental organizations that promote uh, 
changes uh, well in politics and education in uh, well, uh, public spaces uh, and in, jo in job placement too for people with autism. It's, it's not like um, the <laughs> everything uh, is um, uh, looks uh, well. The, 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 I'm, I'm not trying to say that these programs are sufficient, but it seems that the speed uh, of uh, these initiatives um, and uh, the speed of their implementation is uh, well is quite nice. I mean uh, that um, in big uh, in in large cities there uh, will emerge uh, programs or job offering jobs, it's usually NGO supported programs for people with autism that offer well, job places. Usually, uh, usually still it's like sheltered workshops uh, or, but not always. There are some examples of uh, inclusion uh, job placement, so inclusive job placement, so to say. So, um, uh, services for children uh, naturally are more developed than for adults. And uh, when I was conducting that research with families, it was in 2000, in 2016, 2017. And um, at that time, everyone was talking that there was well, almost, uh, well, uh, th th there were services for children, but uh, there were no services for adults. No, no services, no job placement, just uh, a ch child, well, an adolescent finishes school and then, and then nothing. Uh, and um, just, just, well, she could spend her time sitting at home. Uh, with her parents, uh, but uh, since that uh, period, some initiatives uh, well, they uh, they develop in, but uh, naturally in in, in some of uh, the largest uh, cities. Well, um, I hope I just uh, I answered and at least partially, partly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and we have another comment from uh, uh, Emily says, thank you. Uh, and then we have another comment from uh, Maria Gomarini, uh, who opened our series actually. Uh, she says, thank you, Anna, for this fascinating presentation. Great work. I really yeah. want, uh, want to second this, uh, this comment. And um, we, I, I realize we are out of time, uh, so please forgive, uh, forgive us, but I, I do want to ask maybe the last question here. And I want you to, uh, to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the families and the care work that they do, if any, uh, is special and, and how it differs if we, uh, if we think about the child homes as opposed to the institutions for adults. Do families participate at all? Do they, uh, how do they uh, surface? What do they do? Do they provide any care? Um, so just what is the family role? Uh, do you mean the family role uh, for the, uh, when they institutionalize a child or when the child leaves, lives in a family? When, uh, when, when they're already in the institution. institution okay. yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, well, um, um, some of the children, uh, well, they're um, like complete orphans, so uh, t uh, parents uh, have uh, refused them, uh, and so they don't take any parts. Maybe there's it's one third of the children in the institution. Uh, as for others, the majority, oh, when I worked, uh, well, when I was doing field work, uh, the majority of the parents, well, they didn't take any part. So they legally, they kept their um, uh, parental rights, but they never, never came to the institution. Then the legislation changed and they had to, if they wanted to keep their parental rights, they had to visit the child at least one, two times a year. 
Uh, and uh, well, uh, in fact, they, they, some of them started to visit, and when they started to visit uh, once, uh, twice a year, they started to visit more, more often. Um, in uh, um, well, my, for example, in my in, in my group, uh, there were uh, two children um, who were visited by their parents from time to time. Usually, the parents uh, they brought some cookies, uh, some presents to the nurses. Uh, well, and they could take a child for, for a walk just for an hour. Um, but uh, interestingly, one of the boys was uh, then um, taken back home uh, well, after I finished field work, just uh, uh, when he was probably already reaching the age of 18 and had to be transferred to the adult institution where the... Um, um, and that institution is well. It inspires more fears because the care is is worse uh, there. And um, and there were other cases uh, when uh, parents um, did the same, and that was due to the changed public discourse on disability and on parenthood and on family. Uh, and uh, due to some changes in the social policy towards the families with children with disabilities. So this, uh, a certain conservative turn of this family policy, in fact, in this sphere, it, it, uh, it had some uh, good outcomes because uh, families started to, um, well, the, the rates of institutionalization dropped and some of them started to, mm, um, well, return the children's home, uh, and uh, and um, there are um, a lot of um, adoption, uh, adoptive parents and families also appeared. So uh, and uh, but but uh, well, um, some other parents they just remain this. Uh, Formal, <laughs> quite formal, in a quite formal role, visiting well twice a year and just uh, having some small communication with uh, children. That's it. Thank you. All right, I think uh, this is a good uh, a good place to wrap up. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but thank you so much for this amazing and such rich presentation. Um, and thanks everyone uh, in the audience for attending and for your questions. Um, this has been a really, uh, a really insightful um, time for me too. So just uh, before we uh, disconnect, I wanted to remind us that we still have two more talks uh, in the series and we'll, uh, our next talk will take place in January, uh, January 19th at noon. And we'll hear from Dr. Thomas Matza, who is the author of uh, a book uh, that was out in 2018 called uh, Shock Therapy, Psychology, Precarity and Wellbeing uh, in Post-Socialist Russia. Uh, tune in for our next talks and uh, happy end uh, of the semester to everyone. Take care. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me and um, I would be happy to join the, the presentation, the next presentation, if, if you don't mind. Of course, of course. I'll send you the link. Thanks. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.